Good morning, uh, I'm Brother Donald, the Spirit Man, and I am back with you uh, this morning on this um, April the 30th, 2011. I wanted to make sure that I did put the date in uh, to date this uh, program. There's a lot of things that um, is going on and, and happenings. What we're going to do this morning, we're going to have a discussion uh, probably around the... 11.15, going to have a uh, guest on. We'll have Brother Steve Coakley on from Los Angeles, California, by way of Washington, D.C., originally from the windy city of Chicago. Uh, former uh, mayor A to um, Mayor Eugene uh, Sawyer. Uh, worked with the city council uh, before then and have uh, worked with uh, other uh, political uh, figures in, uh, wa in, excuse me, in Chicago, Illinois. So we will be talking to a brother, a very knowledgeable uh, brother who have um, over the years have uh, laid the foundation, laid the track for us, what we so-called the New World uh, Order or folks talking about the uh, Illuminati. And the Illuminati said they wouldn't go by their name. So a lot of people are talking about uh, the Illuminati and looking for a Illuminati and haven't found it as of yet because it doesn't go by its name it changes uh its name so we will have uh, brother steve on uh, around the uh, around uh 11 15 and we're going to uh, go into a discussion about our brother uh, malcolm x dealing with the new book by uh, manny Marable. a lot of you have uh, read that book and if you haven't read the book you need to go down to 1356 west north avenue Every one place uh, and pick the uh, book up, not online, not on some Amazon or any of these other uh, websites. We're going to do this uh, person to person. So you go down to every one place, 15, 1356 West North Avenue and pick the uh, new book up uh, about uh, by Dr. Manny Marable on the uh, on our brother uh, Malcolm X. So. There's a lot of things going on and happening uh, in this uh, city. The mayor had her town hall meeting uh, Thursday evening. It was a little improvement from before. They tried to tighten it up a little bit. But it was still exclusive that those who had filled out uh, slips or sheets to speak, uh, everyone didn't got, get the opportunity to speak because... Um, some folks and some voices, they did not wish to be uh, heard. And the problem that we have in this city right now, besides all the others that we have, is the one of our people losing our uh, homes through numerous uh, mechanisms that are in place to eventually your property will wind up on the or being a part of the annual tax sale. And it's going to be very detrimental to our elders and our seniors within uh, the uh, community. One elder spoke uh, Thursday night that she did not receive a water bill. And have not received one for a while. Her house was on the tax sale list. Even though her bill was paid. She went to express the difficulty that she had went through to try to rectify this situation. And folks could not uh, find uh, the funds that she had sent in. The money just disappeared, she said. But we find ourselves uh, in this city at this particular time that people are going to lose their homes over little or nothing. Because of a water bill, because of a uh, sidewalk or alleyway or some other kind of municipal fine or lien that has been placed on the property. It's a land grab here in Baltimore. It's a land grab in this city. And Monday morning, we need all of you to blow up city hall switchboard 
The phone number is 410-396-3100. You want to express to those, your representatives, that half of the time you don't know who they are, you don't see them, and they don't do anything for you. You want want you to blow those uh, city hall lines up to tell the mayor to stop this upcoming tax sale. Stop this upcoming property tax sale. People getting citations because of, there's not a top on their trash can. People getting citations because they may have two bags on the side of that trash can. People getting citations and fines and liens because the trash man may come through. Take the bags out of the trash can. And then some other apartment, maybe somebody from housing may come through after that and write them up a citation for trash bags not being in the trash can. These are the kind of things that are going on. People are being charged of 50, $100 for these fines. Through the environmental board and they are hiring more people to write citations. It's revenue enhancement off the backs of homeowners, those who decided to stay in this city when the others left. And now they're coming back and they're getting the services and you are not. Are you tired yet, Baltimore? Black Baltimore, are you tired? In a segregated city, in a segregated state, in a segregated country. Treat it less than what you are. And it's not acceptable and you need to stop accepting it. Evil rides high and supreme. Because those that say that they are righteous are sitting on their lawns. Wringing their hands, talking about going to put it in the Lord's hand. You abdicating your responsibility of doing what we, you, I, us, supposed to be doing for ourselves. It's not devoid of people participation. It's not going to change until you change it. It's not going to change until you change. Acting like happy plantation slaves on a, on this Baltimore, this Maryland plantation makes no sense at all makes no sense at all of how we have to live in this city lead paint lead poisoning lead in the water when i was at mergenthal the other day they had a water cooler then the uh machine had water uh, inside the machine that you could purchase. They still got lead in the board in the schools. And if it's in the schools, it's in coming into your home in these old, rusted, dusty, dirty pipes. So I'm going to uh, step back for a moment and get this program going uh, that the hopefully uh, my guests will be uh, coming on uh, soon. So. We're going to see what we can get into this morning. So I uh, thank you very much for listening to this um, program.
Good morning. The program is Stolen Property. Every Saturday morning from 11 to 12 noon here on 1590 WFBR on your AM dial. So I'm going to uh, see if I can bring uh, uh, Brother Steve up. Brother Steve, are you there? Yeah, you coming out. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. I, I apologize, my brother. Baba, how you be? Oh, okay. We on the air? We on the air, brother. Ready? We rolling. All righty. How you doing, brother Donna? I'm doing the best I can, doctor. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. I'm doing fine. Uh, I've been uh, uh, reading this uh, very... I hear uh, feedback in the background. Yes, sir. Is very this... paramount. Uh, very paramount uh, work uh, on uh, Malcolm X uh, by Manning Marble, and it's and it's a weighted it's a weighted conversation. You will feel you will feel a set of situations that have plagued our leadership uh, uh, from the post-slavery, or I should say, from the slavery period. Yes, sir. In fact, uh, the various variances in opinion that affect people's actions and even in the course of time uh, affect them violently, affect them positively, and sometimes stall and delay uh, the development of our race uh, based upon that anyone can have an opinion, whether it's scientific or quite stupid. Yes, sir. And how one responds to the opinion that they have can be equally as intense, quite sophisticated, or quite stupid. And that has had an impact on our community. And the weight of this book, um, I felt it was important to have a discussion uh, about this book uh, uh, that was written by Manning Marlboro, uh, who, uh, quite frankly, uh, is unable to speak to his work. I would imagine that if uh, if his, he had lived, and it just so happened he died maybe a month and a half ago, uh, uh, on a Friday of the week that his book was coming out, at only 60 years old. 60 years old. He's quite a young man. That's right. And the fact that uh, he's unable to speak to the book has or will inhibit the masses of the people being attracted to its commentary because there's no one to speak to it. Yes, sir. And the value of the discussion that we'll have today is to entice people to pick it up, to look at what it offers uh, in a way of providing a background for the study of leadership, but also to surround various conversations and other works that are available and it's excellently footnoted the bibliographies the periodicals the thesis will describe that in detail the uh, historical uh, footnoting these are footprints for the living yes it is that are in this book and uh, very well researched the access that was obtained by Manning Marble is unprecedented. Uh, there are quite a few quotes there from Minister Farrakhan, uh, Brother Larry Forex Prescott, who yes, at that time, who now we know as Brother Akbar, the international representative of the nation. And the fact that prior to this, and you can verify this by just looking at what's available, that Many of the speeches that Malcolm had given that we are aware of are post the separation between him and the Nation of Islam. And it mentions in the book that uh, Manning Marlboro came to Minister Farrakhan and asked about access to the speeches of Malcolm while he was in the Nation. And it says that after a nine-hour conversation, that access was granted, and there are quite a few very intimate observations that are denoted nowhere in history 
that are in that book, mm -hmm. and it deserves to be spoken to, and it deserves to be read. And hopefully we will, over this course of this show, and sometime in the future, entice our people to read uh, this microscopic observation of detail of a man, his strength and his weaknesses. And I think it's a very paramount and significant work. And one, one more thing I want to say to this is that uh, Manning Marlboro died from uh, inflammation in the lungs, mm -hmm. which is fluid. Yes, sir. And it appears that, that, that this problem had been plaguing him uh, uh, he had had a double lung transplant, which I had never heard of, in July before his death. And that inflammation of fluid is like uh, congestive heart failure. Yes, it builds up a fluid in the body where the heart is unable to uh, effectively pump the blood through the body, and fluid begins to build up. And it can be a very hazardous. And it's interesting that uh, uh, in the book, uh, uh, Malcolm, who was working very intensely, uh, an intensive schedule, uh, you'll learn the multi capabilities of Malcolm as a writer, a speaker, an organizer, a leader, a disciplinarian, a visionary. When you learn these things, you see that there was a lot of load on a man, not to even gather the attention. And at one period, Malcolm was having uh, chest pain yes, sir. Uh, and stomach pain. And what was interesting is that Malcolm goes to the hospital. What he calls severe pains in the chest and stomach. Malcolm goes to the hospital, and uh, he's diagnosed with heart Palpitation, palpitation, which is like a rapid heartbeat, mm -hmm. which is a symptom of congestive heart failure, and inflammation around the ribs, which is, again, the buildup of fluid around the lung area. Now, this is what's interesting about political hardball. The doctor at the hospital where Malcolm stayed two days told Malcolm that he was suffering from exhaustion and what he needed to do was to rest. Knowing that this is a government infested intelligence community spy undermine world, yes, sir. The, the agents of the U.S. Uh, 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 boss and detectives in New York went to the doctor after Malcolm was released and asked the doctor what was Malcolm in the hospital for, and the doctor said, for a coronary problem, hmm. which is a heart problem. Now, he don't tell Malcolm. The doctor don't tell Malcolm it was a heart problem. That's right. He tells him to go rest. But he tells the police on the spy route that it was a coronary problem. And those symptoms, inflammation in the body, is something that plagued me, that had me knocked down for seven months in a hospital. Yes, sir. I remember Inflammation that. in the lung area that, that affects your feet, your legs, your thighs, can make you unable to walk. And our people need to be very sensitive to things like that, uh, aneurysms, and other almost casual appearing uh, diseases yes, or symptoms that can affect our people and can be uh, explosive and uh, can be uh, uh, instigated, but be so subtle that one does not suspect. So, Malcolm, uh, the, uh, the policeman, last thing to this, the police asked the doctor, who is his outside doctor and where does he work at, and they gave them that information. So they give the police the correct diagnosis, they give Malcolm a phony diagnosis, and Malcolm then goes on about his way. Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Steve, one of the um, interesting things about this uh, book, 
uh, and anyone who uh, and everyone should get the uh, book. It's a it's not an easy read because it's a lot of pages, but it's something that we have to really go into to get a really good understanding of some things that was going on around Malcolm because I was jumping between two book two or three books when I was just going through this new book by Manny Marable. It took me back to uh, the uh, brothers, uh, took me back to the uh, autobiography to page uh, 419. It took me to the Judas uh, factor. Uh, it was just so many things that uh, I had to go through when I would run across something, I would need to cross-reference it with something else. So, uh, Brother Steve, uh, could you add to anything to that, my brother? Well, I tried to for the sake of the purpose of the conversation. Yes, sir. I had assembled around me a group of uh, Malcolm books, articles, tapes, uh, movies, interviews. I, I, I kept it down to reviewing uh, a set of interviews that that Manning Marble had done before he died with Democracy Now! Mm -hmm. that ran on Democracy Now! Uh, with Amy Goodman and uh, the post interviews that were done with uh, Dyson and Bill Fletcher, a, uh, a union leader, and the book itself. Yes. Uh, being that I didn't want to be influenced by the work of the others because I think that if you if you get the book, which is, as you said, it compels you to pull out the other books. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, you could add, uh, uh, we could add many books, but the best thing about this is that in this uh, reinvention of the life of Malcolm X, there's an excellent, excellent uh, uh, footnote the book is well footnoted. You know, many times our books are not footnoted. And uh, uh, we have a lot of conversation without attribution. Yes, sir. And uh, 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 in this particular book, uh, there's a government document from the FBI, CIA, etc. Uh, freedom of Information releases, archival collections, uh, Schomburg, University of Wisconsin, You'd be surprised some of the institutions that are holding collections of work on Malcolm or people who work with Malcolm. That's right. Oral histories, interviews, newspapers and periodicals. How many dissertations, doctors and masters, theses were written on Malcolm? He collected everyone that was available. Journal articles on Malcolm and the books, pages and pages of books probably the most extensive bibliography I have seen, not only on Malcolm, but practically on any African in America's work and surrounding work. And, uh, and the index and the footnote, uh, this is Paramount uh, Collection. Yes, sir. So that if you were to get to the back of the book, you'll have a huge menu of Malcolm related books, articles, pieces that are researchable and make one of the most and part of it was that much of the interpersonal of Malcolm was not really known in the public. Again, much of the conversation was post it was the Detroit Red game. That's right. And then it was the post Nation of Islam game. But when Malcolm went to build the various mosques in the various cities, uh, how issues were used, his interaction with the civil rights all-stars, That's right. uh, him sitting under a tree watching the march on Washington uh, uh, um, uh, when the word had been put out for members not to participate at the march itself. Uh, in and around the march were members, yes. some under press responsibilities, some in curiosity, uh, some selling the Muhammad Speaks, which was the newspaper at that time. But it, 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 uh, it is that source. And uh, if one were to have such a collection as to all those things, it would fill up a house. Yes, sir. It would, in hard copy, it would fill up a house. Because I went through, um, 
the book and found some interesting uh, details when it started getting into the relationships that Malcolm was uh, having with, uh, with also with his family, but also with the uh, brothers and sisters of these, the leadership within the nation, within these particular temples or mosques throughout the uh, country and, and his relationship with New York. Yeah, in which, which way? Um, at some times, uh, majority, uh, New York was his uh, base, so he had a lot more freedom in Harlem than he would have in other cities throughout the country, if I'm correct, Brother Steve. Well, you know, of course, uh, I lectured at Roxbury College in Boston. Yes, sir. And uh, you, 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 you'll see a lot of Malcolm X right there in Boston. And uh, Boston was his original forte. Mm -hmm. uh, he eventually came to New York. In fact, I was just reading uh, earlier this morning, uh, at one point he was the uh, minister responsible for uh, New York and uh, also Washington, D.C. simultaneously, yes. uh, as they had been having some trouble down in D.C. And uh, the thing about the book is those the chapters are dated like 61 to 63 or April to November, things like that, that put time frame, and then you could put the whole civil rights struggle in that context. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the relationships go, uh, and I was, as I was looking back at this democracy now, I saw that uh, Eric Michael Dyson uh, mentioned it, uh, that uh, there are details about Malcolm's sexual life with Betty, uh, an aura of dissatisfaction that he seemed to have relayed to others because it had to be relayed to others. But Malcolm had also written Elijah Muhammad saying he was having a hard time, excuse me, dealing with Betty's dissatisfaction uh, where uh, she wanted to, he, she wanted him to spend more time with her That's right. sexually, and he, with the pressures, the demand, and the constant uh, about the world, uh, prioritized less those interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, you you could underestimate those things because in reality they have a huge impact. Your wife your girlfriend, your mistress, your interpersonal relationship, your jealousies, your, uh, your fantasies, these things have a great impact on the work of leadership. Yes, sir, it does. And people can underestimate these things. Uh, a, a great man could ruin, a, 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 a man could ruin a good woman, uh, 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 a great man could be ruined by a good woman, uh, a woman, uh, these relationships have an impact. And it had an impact on Malcolm. Uh, uh, finances have an impact on a relationship. That's right. It, sometimes if you don't have the money to buy the things that a family needs, it affects your leadership capability. Yes, sir. Uh, how one talks against you to other people in a clandestine or secret way has an impact as well. And these things went on within the nation over the, the, the relationship between Elijah Muhammad and people that accused him of, uh, of uh, uh, activity outside of wedlock. Um, um, uh, the same thing happened in Martin King's life. That's right. Uh, uh, had an impact uh, activity outside of wedlock and how Gay Edgar Hoover responded, who had never been married, responded to sexual activity of Martin King. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 Malcolm's desire for someone, uh, Sister Evelyn, mm -hmm. that somebody else was uh, having interaction with. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, in fact, I re it's interesting that the day uh, Malcolm uh, is uh, meets, a, meets a nurse of a foster parent, uh, and uh, when she first looks at him, she says, boy, he's malnutrition. <laughs> uh, he's suffering from malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And that was Betty looking at Malcolm for the first time. And, uh, of course, that then led into the conversation about his medical moment. But those relationships uh, can never be underestimated. 
and I know it's affected me mm-hmm. and my ability to do work uh, and everyone. And how you manage and maintain those interpersonal relationships have a lot to do with how well your stewardship is able to succeed or not. And even in the post uh, uh, NOI separation, there's conversation about Malcolm and other women, names I was unfamiliar with, who were uh, uh, administrators in the OA, OAAU and uh, administrators in uh, Muslim uh, Mosque Incorporated, who Malcolm obviously had sensitivities to uh, that uh, were impacting uh, in his relationship. Uh, like I say, I was unaware of these names mm-hmm. or these people or their roles. So it's the first, my first encounter uh, with some of that. And uh, in that chapter, there's a chapter called Brother, a Minister Has to Be Married. Yes, sir. And in that chapter, uh, Malcolm values about a Muslim wife mm-hmm. uh, and role, his feelings about marriage, his Betty, a series of observations on what marriage between them and life was like, and a conversation about him and Evelyn, uh, who was eventually transferred to Chicago uh, upon knowledge of, uh, of uh, Malcolm, uh, Mary, and Betty. Uh, and uh, a conversation about Betty's history and Betty's family. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, her father was a graduate of Tuskegee University. Mm-hmm. He went to Tuskegee before eventually transferring up to New York in the nursing. And uh, uh, it's just it's got quite, quite a lot of detail, a lot of detail there. Yeah, because when I was reading uh, that uh, about uh, Betty's uh, family, um, it, it struck me that made, it made me want to go in a little more to find out a little more about her family because it seemed that they were more of the, you would put it as the, a part of the aristocrats of color? Yeah, the black middle class. Yes, sir. Mother was in the NAACP and the National Council of Negro Women, and they, uh, they were in the Detroit area. Mm-hmm. And yes, they were uh, they were uh, middle class blacks. We we we, we uh, know as what many upper so called upper class blacks at that time. Uh, uh, but yes, they had aspired those values. They didn't want they didn't want Betty to marry Malcolm. Uh, they said he was a Muslim. Mm-hmm. They wanted a Christian. Yes, sir. They wanted a Christian um, uh, a husband. And when tight money came, when money became scarce. That's when the families really put pressure. Yes, sir. That's for sure. sure. That's for sure. And uh, so that has a big impact. And yeah, that was interesting. Uh, thing, another part of some things I did not know. Yeah, because I didn't know at one point that uh, I didn't know that the children of Brother Malcolm came up through Jack and Jill. Yes, check that out. Yes, yes. sir. Because she was a Delta. R- right, 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 right. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um. I didn't really get to go really deep into the book, and I will go seriously deep into the book because there's so many, so much in there that fills in so many uh, spots and so many places of some things that we uh, know about Malcolm and so many things that we did not know that was going on and, and happening that uh, it was a very difficult environment for him to work. And as he was trying to uh, build a coalition with the Uh, Martin Luther King and the other uh, brothers and sisters within the civil rights movement because he really wanted to get into that uh, arena to be able to uh, bring our uh, folks uh, together. Well, you know, at first he condemned Uncle Tom. Yes, sir. And uh, he called out Whitney Young and and, uh, Roy Wilkins uh, uh, and many of the others uh, of the civil rights all-stars as... um, uh, uh, there was a core. Eventually, SNCC was developed. That became a little bit more radical. Uh, uh, Marion Berry was head of right. uh, SNCC at that time, say, in the D.C. area. And uh, uh, you had Baynard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph. Oh, it was interesting comments in there about uh, Baynard Rustin yes, and sir. His, uh, being exposed as uh, uh, having uh, been busted in 41 for. Uh, public display 
of his gay activity and mm-hmm. uh, uh, how he had lost certain jobs. And, you know, you had uh, the House on American Activities affected the right. communists and the socialists and what impact that had, too, on certain forms of the leadership and even include Nathan LeBrandon. And um, um, uh, so he, uh, he, he, he uh, spoke very highly of the nation uh, and separatism uh, as a as something that would be the only thing that could work. Yes, sir. And I thought something was real interesting too was that uh, uh, Malcolm, who was a product of the North, and Martin King was a product of the South. Oh. Now, when uh, Malcolm, and you'll see this in the book, when Malcolm is sent south to organize mosques, the uh, raci- racial uh, rigidity and white supremacy made it difficult for Malcolm to convince the Negro in the South that separatism was of value because there was already separatism due to white supremacy. That's right. So he had a difficult time convincing people in Birmingham that they shouldn't have the bus boycott. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, the leadership, and they say Bernard Ruskin was very effective in a debate against Malcolm yes, sir. by saying that, you know, your choice to do nothing makes you a pacifist and a conservative, and these are things that have to be done. These people are suffering. You That's can't right. tell them to do nothing while they suffer. And eventually, Malcolm had a meeting with the Klan, which which made it obscure, made him obscure, and he eventually had to play down those relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Malcolm was not effective as effective in the South as he was in the North. That's right. And take the reverse. Martin King, this is not in the book, but Martin King was very effective in the South. That's right. The eating in the homes, the country getting together, the organizing and the protesting and the marching and the laying down and the turning of the teeth. But when Martin went north, when Martin went to Chicago That's right. and the other urban cities, he had a more difficult okay. time. That's right. Now, if the meeting, which we know is a famous play of the meeting of Martin and Malcolm, if they really had a meeting, that would have been quite a discussion to exchange those strategies where the man who wasn't as good in the South could work with the man who wasn't as good in the, mm-hmm. in the North. Because that was something that plagued the two of them in being the uh, primary um, uh, rabble-rousers of their time. And so when the march on Washington came, there Malcolm, you know, had spoke against it. Members of the nation, Raymond Tariq, had warned That's members right. to... Make stay a choice. Away. You're going to get with that Negro thing and you're going to stay. And Malcolm held up the nation as the only way it could succeed. Now, the three missing chapters, the three missing chapters in the, autobi- in the autobiography of Malcolm X. And there was a man named Alfred Falk who collaborated with Alex Haley and took him to the FBI and they began to collaborate uh, and receive information from the FBI that resulted in an article called The Merchants of Hate. Hmm, that's right. That Merchants of Hate eventually became a part of that whole process, the hate that hate produced. Reduced. We could talk about Mike Wallace, mm-hmm. whose assistant was Louis Lomax. That's right. Uh, on that, on that uh, particular activity. But... Um, uh, the three missing chapters is uh, foreseen that they were about Malcolm's envision of the nation integrating in not with the white power structure but with the black uh, uh, social activity and that the role of the nation could have a significant impact That's right. which as Manning Marlboro mentioned in the interview became uh, the result of a million man march mm-hmm. under Minister Farrakhan, oh, where you saw people of all religions and of no religion gather together in a, a public display of solidarity 
uh, because it would cross over the various lines. And at that time, people had uh, had advantages for separation. Yes, like, sir. I hope they never get together. And so there was always a need to keep the rivalry going that kept the uh, this one and that one. Now, Malcolm had a thing. There's, in fact, there's a, a very good quote where Malcolm talks about uh, the uh, Negro in, uh, uh, intelligentsia. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, uh, the comment, which I want to share with you, well, basically it says he's, he's telling the Negro leaders that if they don't, the Negro leaders, the educators and others, that if they don't get it together, he says, if the present leaders of the so-called American Negro don't unite soon, and take a firm stand with positive steps designed to eliminate immediately the brutal atrocities that are being committed daily against our people. And if the so-called Negro intelligentsia, intellectuals and educators, won't unite to help alter this nasty and most degrading situation, then the little man in the street will henceforth begin to take matters in his own hands. That's right. The little man in the street. Yes, sir. One of the things I noticed when I was reading uh, the uh, book, Steve, when you were talking about the uh, Malcolm and the civil rights leadership or the Negro uh, civil rights all-stars was that that bothered Malcolm a lot. It really did. It, it did, It yeah. bothered him a lot. That's what I picked up in the book. And it, ch- it altered and changed uh, his perspective on a lot of, of things because he felt that he was, uh, he wanted to, he wanted to be involved in what was going on and what's happening uh, on the uh, social uh, front and the political front, but where he was at that particular time and uh, being under the restraints that he was under, that he could not move into, fully into that direction. Right, good choice of word, restraint. And it's interesting that, uh, that uh, when the March on Washington was coming, now, uh, Baynard Rustin, uh, after he was expelled from many organizations and uh, had been uh, convicted, uh, he uh, came to New York, and Baynard Rustin and Malcolm became friends. That's right. Uh, and they talked for many hours and days and even had a debate where uh, Manning Marble says Rustin got the best of Malcolm because some of the, some of the reactions to the hates of whites could not be justified in separatism. Correct. And so uh, that had an impact on Malcolm. Yes, it did. And when in 62, A. Philip Randolph as the chairman and Baynard Rustin as the vice chairman That's right. began to organize for the march on Washington, you could kind of sense Malcolm having a need for it to fail, mm-hmm. that he really wanted it to fail. And as it got closer, Malcolm, in fact, invited the same Negroes he used to speak against, Whitney Young and Roy Wilkins and the Civil Rights All-Stars, he invited them to a rally that he had that over 2,000 people uh, showed up at around the March on Washington's uh, purpose. And the only one that even responded, though he didn't show up, was Adam Clayton Powell. Powell that's right. Now, Malcolm was asked at a forum once, Cannot a black man infiltrate the political system and uh, uh, work towards uh, black militancy by infiltrating the system? And Malcolm used Adam Clayton Powell as an example or a prototype of the type of person who could do that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And Adam Clayton Powell, for many of our people might not know much about Adam Clayton Powell, even though we would as older not really even the oldest, um, was, uh, was uh, running his congressional district uh, out of the country. And in fact, was attacked and tried to be stripped. He won court cases uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, reinstated his responsibilities, but he was attacked. Uh, and Malcolm admired Adam Clayton Powell. And there were conversations between those two. I also want to mention something that uh, the nation was responsible, and Malcolm and 
uh, and others at a reform school in Virginia of uh, prisoners, inmates, uh, uh, reform school children, uh, gathering, getting the right to have Islamic services within right. the prison system. That's right. And that prior to uh, the push, uh, this had not been granted, or it was strictly a Christian thing, and Muslims were considered too militant to have religious rights. And uh, they pushed very effectively for that reform, and that was accepted and is now accepted, and one knows that one of the uh, uh, strongest relationships that develop in prison are when some of the men turn to Islam, or women, yes, uh, during their incarceration. And uh, that was a significant development. Now, there were issues where um, uh, there was one time where Betty's, uh, uh, they lived in a house, they lived in an apartment, and there were Muslims on all three floors, and the police uh, tried to raid the apartment uh, looking for someone that didn't live there, mm -hmm. and uh, the Muslims fought back, and uh, they were charged with crimes, and there were other instances where Muslims were beaten and attacked. Yes, sir. And cases developed that reminded people of a civil rights struggle. Correct. Different civil rights activity going on by circumstance as opposed to by uh, design. Correct. And so they became involved in that struggle for rights because it evolved as a necessary entity to even service the members of the nation itself. Because that's right, because they were being victimized at the time. And um, I, I was reading that and... Uh, Malcolm had some mixed feelings on uh, on that also uh, that he uh, expressed um, that it was it comes back to the same such comes back to the situation what King and them was doing and and what was happening uh, to the uh, Muslims at that particular time and the direction or the course that they were or how they handled that situation. Yeah, I remember one one particular court case where. The Muslims filled up the courtroom. They were taking pictures of uh, all the people coming in the courtroom. They uh, put their people on the doors. And when the verdict was being read, the judge was so scared he emptied the courtroom. That's right. That's right. And when the verdict was read, they escorted the jurors to the subway. That's right. So that they could get away safely. Uh, 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 allegedly that that would make them get away safely. So... They definitely used pressure uh, in particular issues, and there was uh, beating in Los Angeles, there was activity in New York, mm -hmm. and other cities where uh, they were compelled to respond. And in that case, if it's a court case or it's a police case, uh, Malcolm was very effective at going to the police and getting them in personal dialogue to reduce charges, or to lessen the inflammatory nature mm -hmm. of a situation. He was an excellent mediator. Yes, sir. But that sense of mediation came from a sense of power. If you didn't have the backup and the discipline, then you couldn't compel one to want to mediate. That's right. Uh, uh, a power doesn't mediate with weakness. Uh, they tend to just continue to dominate. Correct. So Malcolm was able... Uh, and his many skills. In fact, there was a comment. Uh, this is worth uh, noting. Uh, the informants who were constantly uh, all in and around Malcolm. Uh, one informant did a uh, did a, a profile of Malcolm, and it was an interesting. It was an interesting profile. Uh, it's on page. Uh, let's see here. Uh, page 139, and it says, in late 1958, an African-American FBI informant candidly evaluated both Malcolm's character and his standing within the nation of Islam. Quote, Brother Malcolm ranks about third in influence. He has unlimited freedom of movement in all states, and outside of the messenger's immediate families, he is the most trusted follower. Mm-hmm. 
He is an excellent speaker, forceful, convincing. He is an expert organizer and an untiring worker who has a strong hatred for the blue-eyed devils. But his hatred is not likely to erupt in violence, as he is much too clever Mm -hmm. and intelligent for that. He is fearless and cannot be intimidated by words or threats of personal harm. He has most of the answers at his fingertips and should be carefully dealt with. He is not likely to violate any ordinance or laws. He neither smokes nor drinks and is of high moral character. And then Manning Marble goes on to say this assessment underscores the FBI's problem. Though the Bureau saw Malcolm as a potential threat to national security, his rigid behavioral code Mm -hmm. and strong leadership skills would make him hard to discredit. Yes, sir. He did not have the obvious vulnerabilities, nor was he likely to be baited into making a mistake. Yet what the evaluation also gathered quite astutely was that Malcolm's authority within the sect emulated directly from his closeness to Elijah Muhammad. It would not take the Bureau long to deduce that any conflict provoked between Muhammad and Malcolm Mm -hmm. could weaken the Negro strike, weaken the nation as a whole. Yes, sir. Brother Steve. Yes, sir. About uh, one minute uh, uh, left. And I wonder, wow. Yes, sir. Time goes fast. One hour is not a lot of time. And yes, and this was this is a very interesting conversation. If I yes, say sir. so myself. Yes, sir. This is just a warm up. We're going to do this uh, again. I'm, gonna... I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this um... because we didn't get to talk about when Castro uh, can't get a right hotel room in New York. New... That's right. And Malcolm yeah. comes up there and brings all the Castro delegation to the, Risa to the hotel. hotel Teresa. Yes, sir. And all of the delegates and ambassadors come to Harlem. They're celebrating that Ron Brown's daddy was the was the man who ran the, the hotel. hotel. That's right. That time. So uh, and a lot of other stuff, man. Uh, uh, man, we're gonna uh, we're gonna get to it. Hate that hate produced uh, Lomax and Mike Wallace. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to talk about there. In the international uh, and the uh, conversations between Elijah and Malcolm. Yes, sir. Uh, even right before he made Malcolm in charge of DC, they had a private conversation in Chicago. And uh, the discipline and, and, and that went on within the nation, uh, sometimes the beating of members to yes, sir. Uh, transact fear. And that was one of the things of Muhammad Ali about why he went with Elijah and not Malcolm. Mm-hmm. He said, I was afraid. Yes, sir. And even Malcolm said, you don't get away from Elijah Muhammad if, he, if he's coming for you. Yes, sir. And then who was really coming for him? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the assassination and the new information that's in the book about the assassination that uh, is deeply worthy of a conversation. Yes, sir. My who was really there and wasn't the planning of the organ of the assassination before he went overseas and then it disbanded and then when he returned. Yes, sir. Steve, uh, Brother Steve, my time is up. I'm a minute over and I want to... Oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I know and I know nothing to be sorry about, Baba. Uh, and I just want to take and uh, mention these uh, sponsors, the folks who pay for this program today. You still there with me, brother? Oh yeah. Okay, so uh, I um, we're gonna talk about uh, when we're gonna do this again. It's gonna be real soon. If we okay. can. Okay. I'm, I'm ready when you are. Yes, sir. So I'm gonna call you uh, this evening, and we're gonna we're gonna put that into place right now. So I'm gonna try. All to, right, good brother. Brother Steve, I'm gonna talk to you after the program, peace. I appreciate you. And I thank you and love you, brother. All right, brother. Hotel. Uh, hotel. Love you too. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. The program is uh, Stolen Property. I'm Brother Donald, the Spirit Man. Be with you every Saturday morning from 11 to 12 noon here on WFBR uh, Soul Classics, 1590 uh, WFBR. Uh, uh, that's 1590 AM. Let me thank uh, the brothers and sisters of Supreme Oasis Bakery and Deli, home of the world famous Supreme Bean Pie. The address is 3223 Garrison Boulevard, 21216. Uh, the phone number is 410-466-7212. The phone number is 410-466-7212. The Supreme Oasis Bakery and Deli, home of the world-famous Bean Pie. Now, 
you go up there and there's, you're going to get some good food. You're going to get some clean food. You get yourself uh, some uh, fish and chips. You can get yourself uh, some good uh, uh, clean uh, breakfast up there at the Supreme Oasis. You got the uh, uh, comeback fish because after you brothers got your dew done and got your hair trimmed, now you're going to go up there. You're looking good and you're feeling good, so you're going to go up there to Supreme Oasis. Uh, on uh, Garrison Boulevard, that's uh, 3223, to get yourself uh, something to eat. That's Supreme Oasis, 3223, Garrison Boulevard, home of the Supreme Pie. The Supreme Bean Pie, where you can go up there and get the Supreme Knowledge. You can go up there and get the Supreme uh, Wisdom. That will raise the deaf, dumb, and blind black man and black woman up here in this uh, city, in this country, in this world, and on this planet. Wish to thank um, Around the Way Bells Bond. We'll bring you back Around the Way, Brother Alan Taylor, agent consultant. Phone number is uh, 410-358-2245. That's Around the Way Bell Bonds. We'll bring you back Around the Way, Alan Taylor, agent consultant. Phone number is 410 410- Three five eight twenty two forty five, and uh, this beautiful sister. The sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. Reality. Our name says it all. Rhonda Winbush, and you can contact Sister Rhonda uh, by uh, the office numbers uh, 410-752-1001 or cell phone four four three eight three eight. 1244. So I wish to thank the brothers and sisters of Supreme Oasis who came to me to be sponsor of this, of this program. And I thank you, brothers and sisters, very much. Uh, much love to you and be through, be, be through there soon to get something to eat. I know I'm ready for that. Fish and chips, been eating them for years. It is a uh, institution, a eatery uh, in this city that's a uh, institution. So my time is up. I'm going to uh, blow up out of here. So I thank you uh, once again for listening to this uh, program. Uh, the program is Stolen Property every Saturday morning from um, 11 to 12 noon here on WFBR 1590 AM Dow. I'm Brother Donald the Spirit Man. If you need to contact me, my phone number is 443-845-9505. Once again, 443 443- Eight four five ninety five zero five. If you wish to be a sponsor of this program, look on the internet, look on your phone book, uh, and look up the station, uh, and send yourself a, a good uh, donation into here. If you wish to be able to uh, just uh, sponsor one program, give me a call at that number, so that we can possibly do two hours on Saturday morning so that the conversation that you just had with Brother Steve Coakley dealing with uh, Brother Malcolm and the new book by Manny Marable that we could go through uh, this a little more extensively. I know myself and Brother Steve, we could talk on on this subject matter for eight hours and we still would be just uh, stretching the surface. So I'll see you next week and brothers and sisters, peace. <laughs>